When we do that, when we have that, it means that we are lingering in Egypt. It means that we are murmuring and complaining. It means that we have like a head like Pinocchio. You know, Pinocchio had a wooden head. All right, a wooden head. We can't even think straight. And our wooden head causes us to not want to choose death rather than life. And we think we're right enough. But it's our, our minds or our perspectives are, 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 are deceived by how we are understanding. We don't recognize the flesh pots of Egypt calling us back. Treat with this person this way. That's the flesh pots of Egypt calling us back. And God says, oh, your complaining perspective forbids you or, or, or prevents you from seeing something clearer, right? Go with me also in Exodus chapter 17. I want you to see this. Chapter 2 and 4. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, why have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children our livestock with this? So Moses cried out to the Lord and said, what shall I do with these people? A little more and they will stone me. Oh my God. Verse 7, he named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Oh my God. So I want you to see the long series of complaints that Hashem would have preserved for us. Exodus 5. Israel complained. Exodus 14 complained. Exodus 15 complained. Exodus 16 complained. Exodus 17, a long series of complaints. And you said, what happened with these people? If I was there, I would never be complaining. Really? Go with me to the book of Matthew. So this is it. This is God now dealing with our perspective. These Israelites, they're complaining. They can't see anything. Really? Can I make the statement to us, brethren? As Israel saw the nations, as the nation saw Israel, Israel is like a mirror. Israel shows what's in our heart. So you don't condemn and point at these people. God is saying, I'm showing you, Israel, so that you can recognize the secrets of your heart so that I'm unveiling. The wrong attitude that's in your heart, you would see it in Israel. So look at, at our master teaching us now. Ex um, Matthew chapter 23, we pick it up from verse 29. What do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Now you read that, you have to remember he's teaching Teshuva. He's not condemning a blanket statement, all Pharisees. He's not condemning them. What he said, I want you to do Teshuva and turn back to me. All right? So what do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. This is the master unveiling to us. You condemn in Israel. You feel if you were there, you would have been different. You would have done the same thing because Israel is just revealing the heart of mankind humankind all right so you testify against your own self that you are, that you are sons of those who murder the prophets fill up then the measure of the guilt of the father you serpents and brood of vipers how will you escape the sentence of hell and live in malchut shamayin and um, olam haba and so here we see brethren that god is saying to us this this lesson that israel is for you and i you know look at it clearly all right so why is this this murmuring why is this this whining and complaining what is god saying to us brethren look at it carefully again whining prevents gratitude when we murmur and complain we prevent it prevents us from being a grateful and thankful people all right we take a minor thing that went wrong and we blow it out of proportion and we begin to murmur and complain. A minor thing that went, went wrong at all. You see, whining doesn't begin with your words. It begins with our thoughts, with our thinking. We think that we have not been fairly treated. We have not been treated kindly. And therefore, we need to murmur and complain. And God is saying to us, when you do that, you cannot be a grateful person, a grateful people. And you are, you're lacking perspective beyond your situation. You're murmuring and complaining only concerning this life. You have no perspective of the kingdom of God. You have no perspective of Olam Haba. If you had that perspective, you will not murmur and grumble and complain in this life. Now, go with me to Job because there's a balance now. Does it mean that God forbid all complaining? No. Go with me to Job chapter 31. God is very a balanced God and he begins to teach us the perspective that you and I should have. So in Job chapter 31 verse 13, we have this balance now. God is very balanced, all right? Verse 13, if I despise the claim, the claim, right, all right, of my male and female slaves, 
when they file a complaint against me. So there is a place for a legitimate, strong, valid complaint to be made. What then could I do when Elohim arises? And when he calls me to account, what will I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? And the same one fashioned us in the womb? So God is saying, listen, there's a place where you could be murmuring and complaining because you don't have perspective. But there's a place where others will bring and call you to account for something that you and I did or didn't do. And treat with them well, because when I arise and I come into the picture now, I am not going to be seeing the case like how you see it. And I want you to understand that God is calling us to account. And we have to do that for each other, right? We call each other to account because there, there are perspectives that you and I don't see. And we need to recognize, listen, the same God who made you made me also, you know. And he's very concerned about how I treat you and how you treat me. He would arise and begin to correct both of us because the, the misled and the misleader are in his hands. God is calling us to account. And you and I should call each other to account, not in a condemning way, not in a murmuring and complaining way, but call each other account so that we can change our ways and come to know the heart of God. So let us learn from Israel. Let us learn from Job because God is revealing something to us. Where are we going with this? Consider this, brethren. Within 10 weeks of the giving of the 10 words, about 10 weeks, right? We see the children of Israel making a golden calf. I made this statement. If an unprecedented sequence of miracles cannot bring about a mature response on the part of the people, then what will? Here you have a sequence of miracles, sequence of miracles, followed by a series of complaints. What is happening here? What is God endeavoring to tell us? What connection does this have to do with let us build a home together? Go with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 25. Shemot, Exodus 25. And here we see something that God gives us that is truly amazing. Exodus 25, verse 8. Let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. Not dwell in it, but dwell among them. According to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture just so you shall construct it what does that have to do the complaints and the sanctuary what is the connection i'm glad you asked what god is saying is this you have been complaining i've registered and recorded all those complaints and then i bring you to exodus chapter 25 and i tell you this oh my god Tell them to build something together. And during the time of the construction of the tabernacle, we see no record of complaining. No, no record of complaints. They're building this tabernacle together and there are no record of complaints. Matter of fact, they had to be restrained in giving. What is God teaching us? What's the connection? Complaints. We begin to build this tabernacle together. No complaint. You have to be restrained. And most of us say, okay, restrain. You're giving too much now. Oh, what a blessing for any man or woman of God to be able to tell the congregation, you are giving too much. What did, they, what changed? What caused us to not be given? What reason we have for complaining that why we can't give? All of that is tapped up now. The connection is the Malhut Shemaim. The connection is the Olam Haba. The connection is let us build a home together. When we get that perspective, then we find our complaining diminishes and is non-existent. And we now have to be restrained from giving because we have seen the king. We have seen Mahut Shamaim. We have seen Olam Haba. Oh God. And we want to pour everything into it. No more murmuring and complaining. So it tells us when murmuring and complaining arises, we have lost perspective. We have a diminished understanding of what God is doing. So here it is, this remarkable proposition. It is not just what God does for us that transforms us. It is what we do for God. Can I say that again, brethren? It is not just what God does for us that transforms us. It is what we do for Elohim. You see... Israel, like us, remember, 
as Israel, so the nations, as the nation, so Israel, it should not be. But that's how, how it seems to be right now until we begin to learn and understand what God is saying and doing. Israel was in this state of dependency. And being in that immature infantile state, the default setting was murmur and complaint. But when they begin to move from passive recipient to active co-creators, now they begin to see things differently. When they begin to be engaged in a project that is beyond them, because the tabernacle represented the kingdom of God and the world to come. That's what the tabernacle pictures. You've got to understand that. When we begin to get that perspective, oh my God, we begin to understand. It is what we get involved in doing for God that transforms us. Because here you had all these miracles. You would think the opening of the sea of reeds would have been enough. You would have think manna would have been enough. You would think water from the rock would have been enough. And we still murmuring and complaining. You would have think God has saved you. It is enough. Dayenu. You would have think, oh my God, he rescued you from danger. That would be enough. But oh, we still complaining. This one don't like me. I can't I don't have enough money to, 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 to pay my rent. I, 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 all kind of things. We murmuring and complaining. Why, why, why is that? But when we get to understand, oh my God. Life is for me to build a home for Elohim. He's working with us. He said, let's do this thing together. And when we get to get involved in that wonderful project, oh my God, we can now handle life. Even if we are 20 points behind, we can leave it all behind because we understand. We have seen the king. We have seen the kingdom. We have gotten a little taste. Of the Olam Haba. We have tasted the powers of the world to come. And we could go through this. We have got this. We could smile. Whether you're in a divorce court or the morgue. You can smile. Because you have an inner confidence. That God has got this. The Jets have won the game. Messiah has won the game. I could be calm. Oh my God. That's what God is saying to us brethren. And so I want to read this quote from Rabbi uh, Sachs. He would have said this, and, and I found it quite interesting, so I'm just reading it from him. He said this, Judaism is God's call to responsibility. He doesn't want us to rely on miracles. He doesn't want us to be dependent on others. He wants us to become his partners, recognizing that what we have, we have from him. But what we make of what we have is up to us, our choices and our efforts. This is not an easy balance to achieve. It is easy, easy to live a life of dependency. It is equally easy to be in the opposite direction, to slip into the mistake saying, my power and my strength of my hands have got me this wealth. The Jewish view of the human condition is that everything we achieve is due to our own efforts, but equally and essentially the result of God's blessing. So God is calling you and I to build this home together. The home we build together, it's building together. It's a collaborative uh, effort. God wants us to work together with him. And when we do that, we begin to understand life. You know, it's, there's a saying that says, if, if the leader is good, the people will say, the leader did it. If the leader is great, they will say, we did it ourselves. I pray God that God will raise up great leaders. That we would get involved in doing not just waiting for the leader to do everything. No, I'm not the sage on the stage. I'm the guy that decides, equipping us to be stirred, to do God's will, to get involved and in leaving it all behind and build for the Malhut Shemaim, the Olam Haba. That's my job, to goad us, to be goaded myself, and to goad us to go in the direction of the kingdom of God. Don't hold on to pettiness. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. Don't build camp in this life. There is an afterlife. Don't be wary. So this one died. So this one died. Yes, we will grieve. Yes, we would, we, 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 we would miss that person. But God says, I am in control of all. Don't grieve as those having no hope. I've given you hope of the Malhut Shemaim. That's why when others die and we're unable to deal with it, it is God, it's, it's, a, it's a loving lesson to us, but God is saying, listen, your faith is so small. And I had to allow this, as it were, to reveal to you your true condition. Let him who thinks he stand take he less forth. And rather than be condemning and, and be vexed with God, no, see it as God saying us, oh my God. I can now thank God for this person's life. And I would grieve because I miss this person. But that person has gone on to eternal rewards. And should I see that person again, then I have to live my life a certain way. 
so that I could be there in that environment. Oh my God. And so God is presenting to us this wonderful thing that he wants us to begin to consider. And you and I begin to see this when we consider government. Uh, 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 another perspective again that we need to have, right? Government represents what is done for us. Government represents what is done for us. Society, on the other hand, represents what we do for one another through communities, through voluntary charities, right? That's what we do for others. So what do you want? All state and no society? All government with little or no community? No, look at it. God began by creating this universe and give us a home. At the end of Exodus, we are building a home for God. And that is what diminishes our, 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 our complaining. Go with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. Again, I'm stirring us to, 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 to get involved in building a home together with God. Teaching us and helping us to see and then stirring us to the depth of our being. Let's build a home together for God. All right. So Ephesians chapter four, we see here verse 11. And he gives some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as shepherds and some as teachers. These are not just titles. They are functions. They are gifts, but they are functional gifts, not just titles. The Gentile perspective is that I'm an apostle. This. The Jewish perspective is that you are sent to serve. These are functions, gifts. Functional gift to the body of Messiah. Why? Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. For the work of service. To build up the body of Messiah. Until why? We all attain to the unity of the faith. And the knowledge of the son of Elohim. That's, that's the kingdom, right? The mature man. Not dependent upon God's miracles, right? To the measure of the stature. Would belong to the fullness of the Messiah. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine by trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming but speaking the truth how in love we are to grow up not just grow old grow up right grow up in all aspects into him who is the head the maturity of the head from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by every joint supply according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body notice now why you want to grow why you want to develop yourself because you're connected to our body for the building up of itself in love this is what god is calling you and i to and it's an amazing thing that he's doing brethren when you and i begin to consider okay these fivefold gifts i think about the five fingers right uh, the five fingers can't do everything the five fingers you have to flow and that that blessing has to come down to the wrist so the wrist can begin to, to move as a result of what the hand is saying all right the fingers and fivefold ministry we're equipping you i've been equipped to equip you because there's a work of service that you have to go and do you have to now wait before God. You have to be the one who go and be that kind person on your job. You have to be that one that says, oh my God, I met with this sister or this brother and my life has been transformed. That's a brick in your eternal home tomorrow. You have to see these things. Let's build this home together. And then you begin to how all things work together for good. Since God is in control, that flat tire and your response is working together for God. That charity that you give, you say, I don't have anything, but I see this person is hungry. I'm going to give all that's in my wallet and my purse, give to God. That might be a flaw in your eternal home. Are you beginning to understand? I'm just trying to speak in human terms so that you could understand the little thing that we do in this life, prepare our eternal home in Mahut Shemayin and in the Olam Haba. Everything God uses. is not amazing? When you begin to get that impression, you say, oh my God, let's, build, let's do this. Let's be strong and act. Let's do this. I'm going to respond this way because I, I want my eternal home. Because you get up there and you begin to realize you have no roof. Right? Or you have no bathroom. Or you begin to understand what I'm saying. Because you didn't prepare in this life for the Olam Haba. Oh my God. God is helping us to see these things. Right? So now this is a good place to remember the five hours. I've mentioned it before. But I'm going to say to us again. God, why did God redeem us? One, redemption. First hour. He redeemed us so that he could... Reveal himself to us, revelation. He could bring us into a relationship. Out of that relationship, there's responsibility. But ultimately, why did he bring us unto himself? For residence. We are redeemed so that God could dwell in you and I. That the Messiah may dwell in our hearts through faith. That when we obey God, the Father and His Son come to dwell in us. I am knocking on the door. And if you let me in, I will come and 
commune. I will dwell with you. These are the things that God is doing in your life and in my life. And he's saying to us, when you and I begin to see this thing, begin to realize, oh my God, based on this Exodus portion, my heart moved me and I give. But once I'm what am I giving? I'm studying. I'm reading all the scripture. I'm studying so that I can know the will of God. I am praying so that I could be kind. So what do we see? Torah, tefillah, chesed. Torah, we're studying. Tefillah, we're praying about what we have studied. And then we are going to do chesed. Because we understand that all these things are connected to building a home together with God. There's this story about this old Jewish grandmother. She was uh, driving in a certain place and she told her, her, her grandson that shul used to belong to us. It was built by angels, but now we have lost it. And the son couldn't uh, understand what the grandmother was saying. What do you mean the shul was built by angels? She said, when you grow older, my son, you will understand. And as he grew older, he came to understand what his little grandmother was saying to him. If it was built by angels, then we must behave like angels. The shul is just like a microcosm of the Olam Haba. If God is building this, then you and I have to behave like angels. Because if we don't, we will lose it. And so he writes this. He's quoting. He says, Woe to the person who engages in mundane conversation in the synagogue. He causes a cosmic schism, a degradation of faith. Woe to him, for he has no portion in the God of Israel. He demonstrates by his levity that God does not exist and that he certainly is not found in the synagogue. He is assert that he has no relationship with him, that he does not fear him, and that he is indifferent to the disgrace of the upper celestial realm. And I ask myself, how is it that we have lost tangible, physical presence in our Places of worship. How is it that we have lost that? What, what were we doing in the synagogue or in our churches? What were we doing? Were we complaining against the man or woman of God? Were we engaging in idle chatter while the message is going on? Were we indifferent to the presence of God? Did we not know that we are being living stones prepared for God's habitation? Didn't we understand that God is about habitation and not just visitation? Did we understand that when we borrow something from our brother and sister, we have to return it because that's a brick in the house of God? How come we lost it? Built by angels, but we didn't behave like angels. We behaved like demons. And we have lost it. And now here we are in our home. Are we distracted by what's happening? The message is going on, but you're distracted. Well, you haven't learned it. You're, you're not ready yet for tomorrow. Do you earn to go back into a physical place of worship? Is it going to be the same way? Then you don't deserve to go back there. If in your little home you can't dress for Shabbat because the king is there. You can't tidy your environment because the king is there. But you say, okay, I'm home. I'm a camera is off. And I can be anyhow. I can talk anyhow I want. I can, whoa, whoa. We have lost it and we're still losing it because we have no perspective of the Olam Haba. But when we be prepared, prepare ourselves. So what? You're in home. Dress like if you're going into the presence of the king because you are in the presence of the king. Don't be distracted. This is sacred time. This is holy time. Your family need to know that. So, okay, you're not in a place of worship. You're in your living room or wherever. The family needs to know this is holy time. Outside the house burning down, do not distract me. And don't allow yourself to be distracted. Because why? It's a synagogue in space. A synagogue in time. Oh my God. The most beautiful synagogue is a synagogue in time. That we beautify. God is about habitation, not just visitation. He wants to dwell with us. And he wants us to work together to build that place for him. And so as I close, I just wanted us to think about something else. I've been reading a book by Rabbi Shapira. He titled this book, The Besorah According to COVID-19. The Besorah, the good news according to COVID-19. So I just read about one or two chapters, and it's really inspired and encouraged by that. It was re recommended to me by uh, my friend, Teacher Grant. And so I started to read this book, and I, I began to, 
to see a different whole different perspective on COVID-19. So I wanted to bring it in because you may say, Rav, what is the connection with COVID-19 and the home that we built together for God? Much in every way. What is this store portion called? Teruma. You're going to see a little insight as we go forward. So consider this, brethren. Without doubt, we are in the last days of the world. We're in this time that Isaiah spoke about and Micah. In the last days, it shall come to pass. In the last days. Notice, not after, but in. So we're in the last days. So something is happening. Daniel said, he said, in those days, the God of heaven set up his kingdom. It's going to happen in these days. I want you to see this, right? So that's what's happening now. So we here we are. An intriguing mystery, brethren. <laughs> we're not certain of its origin. And the response is as if easily baffling. We have COVID-19. The world has changed. An intriguing mystery. But what does that have to do with building a home together with God? I see it now as an amazing opportunity that God has allowed to come upon us to help us understand the reason and the reality behind COVID-19. So that you and I can now prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Micah chapter 3 verse 1 says, The Lord whom you suddenly seek, who, who, whom you seek suddenly, shall, to whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You and I ought to be preparing for the return of the master, return of the Messiah. So you and I should now begin to act and understand that God is filling full prophecy. We are in exciting times. And you and I now begin to see that every action on earth, hmm, it brings about a heavenly reaction. So how you and I respond to this intriguing mystery would either delay or hasten the coming of the king. And so God has, has allowed us to touch everybody because he's bringing us into fullness, brethren. You remember God is about bringing the fullness, heavens and earth come together, Ephesians, fullness, the fullness of the land of Israel, the fullness of the Jewish people, the fullness of, of, of the nation. God is bringing us into the fullness of Messiah. And yes, we're going through the birth pangs, but I want us to see something that I recognize. These are the birth pangs, like pestilence, COVID-19. These are the birth pangs. But I want to also see something. Let's go with me to Isaiah chapter 37. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 37. I want to pick it up in verse 3. Isaiah 37 verse 3. Oh my God. God is at work, brethren. So Isaiah 37 verse 3 says this. They said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress. Hmm. Rebuke and rejection. For children have come to birth and there is no strength to deliver. What does that mean? What can we possibly glean from it? Distress. I don't think arguably we, we wouldn't even begin to, 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 to debate that. We're in a time of distress. But something is happening. The, the children have come to birth, but there's no strength to deliver. Birth pangs of the Messiah. An opportunity has been given to us. But the woman is not willing to push harder to deliver this child. Why? Because the woman is being distracted. Oh, my God. An opportunity has been given to us. You see, God, we serve a God who allows evil calamities to come upon us. He said, I create light and I create darkness. I create evil in the sense that I allow calamities to come. And those calamities are tools that I use. For you to cry out, awaken the mercies of heaven. God says, I allow suffering to come upon the world so that you can awaken the mercies of heaven. Mm -hmm.